Klaus is propositioning Helmut. Now, whether it's sexual, propositioning him. Yes. Right. Whether it's sexual or whether it's business or whether it's just a getting away from Sabina, he he wants he wants from him. Helmut. He That's wants right. him. Now, That's why. Right. If, if why someone, does he want him? If someone well, if someone can read the story as to say that he didn't actually that he actually killed Klaus, then you can certainly read it as saying that he's a, it's a homosexual advance. You could read it. You could read it that way. Although, unfortunately, I think that this Helmut is a very, is very heterosexual. There's nothing going on there. But it, it is, it is a male experience, and it's the opposite of the male bonding experience that you always get, you know, in in the American novel. Remember, as we feel a lot of that in the American novel. Okay, all those, all those male couples go out into the wilderness and they're doing the bonding thing, whether it's uh, the last of the Mohicans or the leather stocking or. Um, Huck and, and Jim and all of those yeah. guys. This is the opposite of bonding. This is a killing story. Okay, so if you think of Arthur and love and death are the same at the, love and hate are the same at the bottom, yeah. whatever. Okay, but when we need to look at more carefully even than you have done, what state is this class in? Think about that this is an economical constructed novel. You've got to think horse, okay? Horse, he did well with the horse because he was on land and he had all his witnesses, right? He brought the horse back, he tamed the horse, barely. But he says, when they talk about the horse, never stand in the way of a horse, and when a horse is running, you can't talk to it, right? And he says, in addition to that, there's nothing I can identify more with, hang, then we modify, I don't care, with which I can identify more than with a running horse. I'm free in the spirit. Free in the spirit, an escaping horse, a runaway horse. He is a runaway horse. And now that he's on a boat in an enclosed space on this lake, in the middle of a storm, with no witness, he releases himself. He is now the runaway horse. And Henry now remembers that you cannot talk to a runaway horse. And he says later, I, I, I remember that that's what he said. So I am feeling unfair to come on his choice. And he cannot talk, you cannot talk to a runaway horse. It is very clear that, uh, what's his name? Loose in the sky with diamonds. Remember, he's hanging back and he's loose in the sky. Okay, losing the sky with diamonds is abbreviation, Beatles are wearing my Beatles shirt today, for LSD. Okay, meaning the guy is high. He is high on whatever boom and door films. He is letting fly. He's having, if you want to call it a homosexual encounter, you can't. Because his endorphins, his happiness hormones, his sexual hormones are just going crazy. And he is that horse that is now running away. And Helmut is afraid that it's going to be the end of the world because he's the rationality principle. This guy is not. He's the physical principle. And he's got to do something to save this if he wants to live. He's got to do something. And you could say it's Notwehr. You know, it's self-defense. That he's kicking it, the, the, the rudder in self-defense, knowing he's killing him. Of course, you can't kill him because he's the physicality principle, right? Because he shows up, like the Shri Auf mentioned. Stuart. There's a wonderful analogy to the, uh, to the swan, the swan was one yeah. of the lines of the description of the feeling of, of not being able to slow down, or what happens if you slow down, is an analogy to a uh, driving a motorboat with a hole in the bottom. We have to drive fast to make the front half of the boat stick up. But uh, this is a fun house, yeah? Yes, because he always thinks about him, and here you have the riding metaphor and the boat metaphor coming together. That if when you are aware that you can't succeed because you've got a hole in the bottom of your boat, how do you come home? And you sit in the back and you may go fast so that the front is, uh, comes out and then you can go. That's a, one, that's a wonderful analogy. That's exactly what's happening here. Except of all the emotions that Klaus has always been trying to control. You know, we know how he lives. He goes home and he works for 12 hours on the, on the typewriter. There's no physicality for him at all. It is all show. And that is what's so brilliant about a character, this character, and this is what Helmut has to acknowledge. If anyone has succeeded in being a master of dissimulation, it's not Helmut, it is Klaus. And he fell for it. Like, of course, Stern also falls for, for, for Stöckel, who is a similarly dissimulated character on, on, on a minor scale. So you could say that what he did is to save his own life 
uh, in, in by 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 kicking the rudder out of his hand. It's not it's not ultimately murder. Although many other ways of thinking about it are definitely part of that scene. You're thinking about all of them at the same time. And because you're thinking about all of them at the same time, because you want to make a decision, that forces you to think about Klaus very carefully. Okay, so so we've released him. And we can go to Schwanhaus. Um, yes, quickly. Could we even say that at that point, Helmut thinks, subconsciously perhaps, I've had enough of Klaus, and I'm declaring my independence. I think that it, that's actually something that's pretty as and, and, and Baza says that is definitely a possibility. All of these things are, are also thought, mitgedacht. They are mitgedacht. They are there. And you, this is in the moment of insecurity. That's when there are many challenges uh, to read us by by Vaza. You really got to have to think it through, and then also say make the decision that you think is right. Vaza said, "Jeder liest sein eigenes Buch." I cannot control. I am not. He, he said that actually very recently, last July. I am not responsible for what I'm writing. By which he means, uh, you read it and you make the decision and you come up with the answer because it's your life and you integrate this text in your life. I can only write this and you and you decide what's, what's it. Jeder liest sein eigenes Buch. I mean, okay. I said there, I'm not quite okay with the statement. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it when we read right. the well, Okay, so you can buy that in terms of he's made a very carefully ambiguous structure in both of these books. He but does. now let's drill down to some of the real specifics. Let's get to Brooklyn. Let's talk about the Yes, let me do it. Okay, are we done? Are we okay with this? Yeah. We're done with this? Good, thank you. I knew this was going to come and I, and I told him, I'm sure this is uh, something else here. Okay, Brookline. We have one page of Brookline in here. It's really, it's really unpleasant. Whoa. Okay, when the German version, I think it's 94. Yeah, I knew you were going to. Okay, can we talk about what I'm interested in the last 25 minutes? Is why is the Schwanenhaus destroyed? Yeah? Why does it get destroyed and what does it mean? I think this is a political model. To some, at least the ending is probably, there's other, other things there too. I think, it's a, I think it's a great book about marriage, and it's a great book about two forms of talking, and it's a great book about what talking means, what writing, what writing means, it's extraordinary. But at the end, when the Schwanenhaus is destroyed, we get this Kaltammer. Kaltammer is a political character. It's also a novella, or it's a, an almost symbolic book about, uh, about the political system in, in Germany. But this all right. Wait, 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 you're going too fast. No, 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 I don't want to talk about this right now. I want to talk about the book. The transvestite is a political... Is I, think it's a, yeah, I think it's a political comment that, this, that the Schwanenhaus was destroyed. But for that, we have to first figure out what the Schwanenhaus means. You have to look at, there are some very intense descriptions of the Schwanenhaus. Its architecture, its interior decorations, uh, it's in its interior stuff, all the furnishings that are in there, we get this when the auction is happening. The auction surely is one of the great set pieces in all of German literature. It is, it is unbelievably wonderful. So I think that's a very, for me, very successful um, social satire, um, social observations was just extraordinary. I don't know how it comes out across in, in, in English translation, extraordinary language. So that's a great, that's a great piece. We know a lot about Schwanenhaus. It's humorous, but I wouldn't it's say it's one of the great set pieces of any literature. It's just a humorous episode. I know, it's uh, because, because every sentence is an allusion to something. Uh, there, are, there are layers and layers and layers um, there. Okay, so including the layer, which we, we, you, you open your comment with the herumkriechen, okay, which you didn't quite, <laughs> quite, quite, you said, um, and with the crawling about on the rug at the very end. Okay, so here the circular motion, that the circular move that we have, which was very explicit, of course, in, uh, in, in the other book, in Fleet and Fear, here we have to return to, this, to the story of Gregor Santa with the herumkriechen, finally, one of the great moments, I think, in all German language literature, German literature, is when Gregor Samsa finally has this insight of dropping down, do you remember this, dropping down on his four feet. And when he's no longer on his, on his hind legs trying to walk around as a cockroach who was not on just two legs, and he has this idea that he's now going to drop and he's going to crawl, crawl on the rug, often often his herumkriechen, uses the same word, and he feels this as an extraordinary liberation. 
not to have to be human, but to finally be who he is. Not to have to pretend to be something that he really isn't, but to give in to, tempt, to the temptation to be who he is. And one of the key sentences, I think, in this book is when uh, Tsuan, Gottlieb, uh, the one loved by God, Gottlieb, says to himself, ich war nie, äh, it's actually said indirectly, er war nie synchron. He's never in sync with himself. That's a key thing. And to be, and in fact, when you go back to this Klaus scene on the boat, what happens with Klaus on the boat for the very first time, he's in sync with himself, which is why he doesn't have a grip on himself. And to get to the state, what happens when you're not in sync with yourself? And what happens when you're in sync with yourself? Now, one of the very surprising things that Balza actually says about not being in sync. Now to actually really quote this. We, we're getting to the Brooklyn Jews. I am not I am not shying away from that at all. In fact, I did want to go to that very very well. He says, listen, and one if you have the German edition, 188. Er war nie synchron, nie eins mit sich, immer im Streit mit dem Augenblick. Dieser Streit ist absolut china for Balza. I'm going to translate it. Dieser Streit heißt Symphonie. It seems like so long. Okay, here is the origin of all of all of us as liter literature. He was never in sync with himself, synchronous with himself. He was never at one with himself. Ni Einstein, never a unit, never at one with himself. Always immer im Schrei, always in a clash with himself, always fighting with himself, and always fighting mit dem Augenblick, with the moment. Always, always struggling against the moment, never being at one. This kind of struggle, this dieser Streit, this struggle is called symphony or novel. That's what a novel is. Okay? And I'm going to read um, a passage from Heimatbuch. At, um, um, at the time, 1978, um, Walter published a book. It is called In Praise of Heimat. Uh, 1978, and it's a small text. It's actually um, watercolors by a, a local artist, and uh, and it's a, a, a book about the Lake of Cons, the Lake of Constance. It's just very short text, and one of those texts is called Verstellung, pretending to be something else. Verstellung, when man sich verstellt or wearing a mask, which is going and the opening. Verstellung überhaupt ist Page 25. Es, es, kommt, es kommt darauf an, dein Problem so auszudrücken, dass du verstanden bist, aber nicht durchschaut. It dep every, it, everything depends on your ability to express, express a problem so that you are understood, but not seen through, but not discovered. That's, that's key. Now, if Walser defines literature, when we read Mother Son, Mutter Son, and uh, um, My World to Come, there's a, another definition of writing that Balzac gets to much later in life, about 20, 30 years later. But at this point, the definition of being a novelist is that you negotiate the discrepancy in your book between how you need to be in public and how you feel in private. And out of that discrepancy and out of that tension comes the urge to write. And we have many urges to write that we witness in Gottlieb Zürn. They're usually letters, and he fishes them back out of the mailbox, and he has a whole drawer yeah. in which he has these letters that he never sends. And he writes these poems, <coughs> and he says, the best thing about the poem is they're not marketable. They cannot be sold. They have no relation to money. Because the poems are an expression of himself. Lots of two less poems, and they're not, not being published. Some of them have not been published. They're pretty bad poems. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, that he, he is, in fact, a writer. But that kind of writing, because he writes when he's at one of his himself on Sunday mornings. Sunday morning writing is going to be essential when we're looking at his 1998 speech which is called a Sonntags predict. Okay, Sunday morning writing is different. And this discrepancy, how do you write for the public? You write for the public in a way that you express the problem clearly, but that you yourself, in your essence, cannot be discovered. 
Now think about the self-characterization of Gottlieb, which is very similar to the self-characterization we get of Helmut. He likes to be concealed, and he feels, in fact, it is unhygienic, unhygienisch, when you are naked. He doesn't want to be naked. He likes to verschweigen. He likes to not reveal himself. Right? Goes together with his, what he does as a makler. Ah, the English makler, and it just goes out a real estate agent. Okay, or someone, now we come back to Sholem Aleichem, right? Uh, or someone who negotiates between two different parties. He does this in real life as a professional, but he also does it all the time within himself, negotiating his um, trying to be in sync with his emotions, but at the same time knowing that he can't be open about them. And we see this guy, in fact, the novel, this novel, has five chapters. And of course, we know that Walter really is a dramatist. I mean, she started out as a dramatist, and the novels are an afterthought. And if you're looking at how the novel is structured and how he paces, there's not very much action in this book, and how he paces the chapters, it's really constructed like a drama. You get the exposition, you get the, 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 the increasing tension, you get the peak of the tension, you get the retarding moment, and you get the resolution, the resolution at the very end. Uh, the key element, so the uh, the uh, the fun, you now come to the fun, you remember the falcon theory of the novella that every no, every novella has to have a falcon in it, a, sim, um, a symbolizing element, and it has, uh, there's a theory, there's a lot of literary theories here uh, about the novella that a that a novella has to have, and I almost think that Joan has is a novella too, has to have a central symbolizing element, and of course we have it here in the Joan house. And I would like to look at, do uh, you want to get the Brooklyn Jews out of the way before we go to the Brooklyn Jews? It's not so much the Jews as World War II, because, you know, there's this... Well, but who is essential for the Schwan House, of course? Yeah, and I suppose I understand the political... What you're saying is, you know, to sweep away the, the pre-war, you know, this house that was built for an industrial... for a banker, Deutsche Banker... 1905. Yeah. And, and, it's, been 1905, and it's got a whole bunch of sort of Nordic... Well, I guess it's not Nordic symbolism, but anyway, Greek... Greek uh, uh, mythology painted into the walls. But, we, but Greek, we have Greek mythology because of Leda. Leda yes. Okay, but we also have okay Middle High Germans. We have Tarsifan. We have Lohengrin. Yeah, Lohengrin. Yeah. 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 We have the very moment when Lohengrin is giving the three gifts, whatever they are, in the Middle High German. I try to figure out my, my Middle High German here. Uh, the, the three gifts, it's a sword, uh, which identify a him. A sword, a horn. A sword, a horn, and a and ring. A, oh, a ring, a fingerling, no? It's a ring. Okay. At least the Yiddish word fingerling is a, is a ring. I'm well, from the Yiddish now. Suffice to say, you know. And, he, and he's identified as the son of Parsifal at that it, point. It's, it's, it's a key you, moment. It strikes you as a, as, a, as, as a building that symbolizes a lot of the bad past of Germany. And, and I'm stuck on those two swans that attack each other and in the end have to be shot. Is that a you know heavily redolent of getting rid of the old regime, putting an end to the old regime? You know, they turn on each other, the good swan attacks the bad. On the other hand, okay, on the other hand, when the injured swan, the one who got the neck his, its neck uh, injured by a boat, uh, by a, yeah, a the propeller on the boat, gets Bedded um, next to the, the swan who is uh, never lost its feathers of use and therefore was ostracized. So you have an ostracized swan, one who got kicked out of the pack, and you got an injured swan. You got two victims. You just in, in society, like you have two injured persons in runaway horse. Now, all of them are deformed basically by society. So one of them is an ostracized swan, and because he would never succeed, in his own society, turned aggressive. Yes? Yeah. Okay? And you got a swan that was injured by industrialization. I might have to read it as flat as that. <laughs> and then two of them are together. And when that injured ostracized swan sees this one that's even worse off, he just 
turns nice because, you know, after all, it's not as bad as the other one. Yeah, you could read it like that. So I don't know if that means anything. No, but more than that, we're talking about the parents of these characters, and we all know that those parents were, you know, living during the Reich, and, you know, well, what were you to... doing, you know, 50, 60 years ago? I mean, you know, that not that the question that this generation asked of its parents? So what was the old lady who was an innkeeper? You know, what were her politics? Or the father who was a butcher? What were his politics? That's a very good question. In fact, the lady who was the innkeeper is in fact a portrait of Vaza's mother. Uh, Martin Vaza is born in this very tiny, tiny village called Wasserburg, which functions here as Smitten. Schwanenhaus actually existed, and it's precisely the way it is, uh, it is uh, described here. In fact, every year I'm staying in a place that is four houses down from the former Schwanenhaus, and I'm staying in a place that was built in 1900 by bankers, and it's one of those villas that looks just like that. I'm staying in a garret, so it's where the, where the servant quarters was. <laughs> and the Schwanenhaus was in fact uh, destroyed, and apartment blocks have been built there. It is an Bausum, a, it's a real sin. And it was done, the Gemeinderat agreed to this procedure because the local artisans, this is why at the very end, you have to be very carefully, at the, at the very end, when you see the architect and you see Kazamar standing there and they're trying to dynamite that thing and it just will not go down. It's like history will not be destroyed. Okay? You got to you have to think of this Kaltama almost as you have to think about uh, Anheim in Man or Man or Eigenschaft, Man Without Qualities. He represents the he's an SC, we see him in Geneva turning into a woman, you know, so I uh, do it. But he is a cold calculating acid. He is another one who has perfected uh, the, the, the <coughs> dissimulation. He appears to be a mention point because he has all these projects, uh, philanthropic projects that he's pushing, but at the, in the end, he's motivated by the, by the profit, by the, by the profit uh, principle, by, by making money. He's a cold fish, and when he sees his advantage, he will go for his advantage. And he, because he doesn't live there, I mean, he pretends that he's going to Burgundy and he's dealing in castles, when in fact uh, he lives in Geneva and he is being a transvestite in his off time. Uh, so then nobody really knows about it, and even as a transvestite, he puts on another costume, so you cannot possibly be known. He is the principle that cannot be known. He is the embodiment of the profit motive, and he will destroy doesn't matter was all regional history. Dialects don't matter to him. Dialects are very important in this in this book. The person who speaks dialect means that you're rooted. In fact, it is said about Julia on the phone that you can tell who she's talking to by the degree of the dialect that she speaks. So you can you are identified by the way you talk to others. The way you talk to others defines how you feel about yourself as a person. Now, Kaltama is very turned off when our Helena principal here, who's called Barbie and who's a surf, surf master, and he gets to be, wins the competition in, surf, in surfing, speaks deepest, deepest dialect. Can't, can't take that. So he is the cosmopolitan, he is the money grabbing kind of, uh, kind of real estate agent who is interested in turning this very beautiful property right on the lake, in fact, right near the harbor, right like, like you know, 100 yards from where you are in the center of, well, it's not a very small village, actually, into a, a set of apartment buildings, and he does that. But, but he doesn't, he just, he's just the broker. It's this... Uh... No, he bought it himself. He, he bought no. the place. And no, Matt Schatz didn't get it. He bought no, the no, place. No, no, oh, yes, he did. No, no, no. There's a, there's a developer, oh. a developer. The builders buy the building. He, 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 he turned developer. He bought the place. He bought the place and he turned developer. That is, that is the principle. And he makes money off of that. And what he destroys is because with, not only is it Gundaya, or not only is it 1905, not is it the Wilhelm period. It's, 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 uh, it's first World War I, it's World War II. It's, 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 it's art, art deco, it's beauty. It, it's not, it's not, but there. it's associated house, with more. The house is, is, no, but it's associated with more. It's associated yeah. also with the inhabitants. And we, we get this allusion to the suffering of World War One, the people who were there down, the people who were in Russia. It's a reference it's to people dying in Russia. What it, represents, it represents the history of Germany, for, for sure. 
the history of modern Germany from 1905, from when the money was made, all the way to the end of, 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 world, of world War II, to the, actually the, the Gründungsphase, the, the building up period of, of Germany. And it doesn't care, it needs to go. And that's why the house is resisting, because history is hard to destroy, but it is getting destroyed. And there's regret about that, clear regret. So, uh, so I've got, got a question, which is, you know, you were talking about the comic elements of this book. I don't read this, the, but that's last, not the, last, the last chapter of this book is tragic, you know, where he oh, just falls sure. under, under the covers and, and just he turns into a baby like she Oh, does. absolutely. You know, the, like, loss, the loss of this house, not because it's money to him, but because he clearly enjoys the beauty of it. He knows the family, he has a deep physical and emotional relationship to that house. He wants that house. And he wants to sell it to the right person. He calls all these people. He calls his composer. You know, he would like him to have it. You know, sell all the other properties he sold him. He calls someone who is actually, he calls Tila, who has a tooth factory. This tooth factory guy was the hero of the previous novel. Jenseits der Liebe is built on Franz Horn and Tila. Hans Horn is the employee of Thiel and he gets sent to England to Coventry of all places. Yes, Coventry. So World War II is never far away. Uh, he gets sent to Coventry to get to get uh, to get uh, Aufträge, to get uh, commissions. Uh, commissions. And of course, and the English guy says, so, but we can't, but we can't do it because da da da. So I mean, it's a pathetic novel. The inside is novel. Maybe Rajanitsky was right about that. Yeah, it's <laughs> Anyway, so these characters from this previous novel from Yitzhak Saliba are making their reappearance and our guy wants to sell down the place. So he's very keen on having it in local hands or in hands which he trusts because it represents family history, um, German history, and he wants that house to be there. He cares about it and that's why the loss of that house to capitalism, to the principle of capitalism, is deeply tragic. Absolutely correct. So you have two. You have two. You have two, in fact two. It's, it's never simple with money. You have two tracks. Okay. You have the tragic track, the destruction of the house. It's, it's deeply, deeply mourned. But at the same time, you do have a gradual improvement of the family. Family relations in this family are getting better. And it's getting better because something unexpected is gained. The turning point in that family is Rosa's decision to have this child. So we have five children, the mother says. And from that moment, she begins to talk. At some point, it says, Seit dem Samstagabend hat sie praktisch nichts mehr gesprochen. Since Saturday night, she practically hasn't spoken. That's when Stöckel comes. And that's when Anna reveals that she's pregnant. And everybody says, you know, it's, you can't have this child, it's not possible. And she is looking into an abortion, and in the end she decides, I think it's on Monday, um, she decides she's going to have, she is going to have this child, she isn't going, she is not going to knuckle under. And the mother says, okay, we'll have five children. And from that moment, things are looking up. And very gradually, she is the one at the end when they're lying down, you know, connubially in bed, and he, he, he has, at this point, he has no more designs on her. And the camera behind that, the curtain is long forgotten, and she reaches out her hand. And, and, and then, you know, the talking begins, the pillow talk, that's the, the, the talk of intimacy. So